Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and our text will be, although we'll not read it all at once, verses 16 through 30, chapter 5, 16 through 30. And we're calling this, All Should Honor the Son. The work of Jesus Christ, to say the least, was very controversial. And we have here in verse 16 and verses 17 and 18 a couple of the reasons that it was. And there are only two of many. One was because, as verse 16 relates, that our Lord healed on the Sabbath and broke the traditions of the Jews in so doing and made them upset with him. And another reason is because in calling himself the Son of God, that made him equal with God, verses 17 and 18. And such activity on Jesus' part moved the Jews to seek his death. They sought to kill him. Of course, that means, and sadly, the one that they should have honored, they desired to kill. John 5, 22 and 23. They had 1,500 years of a law which was designed to lead them to Christ. And when he came, they didn't recognize him. He didn't fit their preconceived notions about what a Messiah should be, which was all false because they had a wrong concept of the kingdom and the Messiah and the Jews' purpose on earth and the law of Moses. Even as one should honor the Father, the reasoning goes here, then one should honor the Son, and in honoring the Son you honor the Father. But in failing to honor the Son then they did not honor the Father who sent the Son. Today, the same is true. And will be to the end of time. and has been since Jesus came. Now from our text, I think we can learn several reasons why men, all men, everywhere, at all times, should honor Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And you'll see how simple this really is, but when you think about the points, they're very powerful. First of all, it is the Son that will raise the dead. Among the, as they're called, greater works Jesus would do is this raising the dead, John 5, verses 20 and 21. And of course, if you read through all the accounts of our Lord's life, you see that we have three different accounts of Jesus raising people from the dead. There was the daughter of Jairus, Matthew 5, 21 through 43. The son of the widow of Nain, Luke 7, 11 through 17. And then, of course, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, John 11, 1 through 44. Now, why was all that done in his earthly ministry? These people, of course, would have to die again, and they did. But it was another point to be made that he had power over death. He had the power to take up life and to do away with life, if you please. One day, Jesus is going to raise everybody from the dead. Look in verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming into which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's pretty potent. 
as I said a while back, and it's good to think of. There's not anybody that's been on this earth, is on this earth, or will be on this earth, however long it goes into the future, who can do what Christ can do. He can get you out of your grave. And it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And now he talks about the resurrection of the just and the unjust, the good and the bad. Those who've done good then are those who are resurrected unto eternal life. And those that have done evil are resurrected to condemnation. Now, if you were to ask me, uh, what's that resurrected body like? Well, then we do have quite a bit about it from the standpoint of being fitted for eternity, even as this body is fitted for now. But this is a corruptible body. The body that we shall have in the resurrection will be like the Lord has right now. Now, that's about as far as I can go with that, except that ought to be great comfort to anybody that understands the glorified body of Jesus Christ as much as we can. But now it's another story when you start trying to describe the body the condemned people will have. There's not much said about that. I don't know what that's going to be like. I don't have much in the Bible to say except where their worm dieth not. The fire's not quenched. In other words, it almost sounds like they'll be, and I'm not saying it's this way, but it almost sounds like they will be resurrected in the body like we have now, and there'll be eternal corruption from then on, where the worm dieth not. That I don't know. I just know the concentration in the Bible is on what there is of it, of the glorified, resurrected body of the faithful. I think it's good that we recognize that as we talk about all this sickness and ups and downs and getting old and falling apart and whatever else, and no matter how, how healthy you may be, there's still the fact that you're a physical human being and there's problems. But you don't have that when you consider the resurrection. It may be hard for us to really think about the fact that as real as I am now in this fleshly body right now, I shall be then. And I think it's good to think about it because it takes our mind off of this which is passing and the problems thereof. Remember, it was Paul who wrote to the Corinthians telling us plainly, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Again, that brings up the idea of in in Christ, that's in the church. We talked about this morning in class how that uh, Ephesians 5 tells us that he will present those in Christ, the glorified people, the church, to the Lord. Only the church will experience this as far as the Christian dispensation is concerned. Of course, the faithful of the law of Moses and the patriarchy will experience the same thing too. But I'm saying when you think about since the church was established and all the myriad of millions of people that have lived on this earth, such a select few, comparatively speaking, will receive the call of Christ at the end of the world to be raised to a resurrection of eternal life. That's one reason that we ought to honor the Son. Pretty good reason, I think. Then there's another reason. The Son is going to judge the world. In John 5, 22, you'll notice that it says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Thus Jesus has authority to execute that judgment, literally meaning condemnation, because he is the Son of Man. What does that mean? Well, remember the writer of Hebrews, for the Christian's good, said he is our high priest. He can empathize with us. He is touched by our infirmities because he's a man. He's been through what we go through. He knows what it's like to live in a body of flesh in this world in time and space and suffer all that goes along with this. And, of course, with him even more 
because he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Jesus is going to exercise righteous judgment because he seeks to do the Father's will. Look in verse 30. I can of mine own self, he said, do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. He is the logical one. He's the obvious one. There could be no other who could be as God wants him to be when it comes to the judgment. So one day, Jesus is going to judge mankind. Such was declared at the household of Cornelius in Acts 10, 42, and by Paul on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 31. And Paul says he's given assurance unto all men that such is going to take place in that he raised Jesus from the dead. And it'll be his words, and we quoted this passage this morning, that will judge us, John 12, 48. His words will judge us the last day. And Paul tells the Romans, and he says the same thing again to the Corinthians, Romans 14, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, that each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now the point being made is, is here's another point. That is that he will judge the world, Christ that is. Another reason to honor him. I think about this and when you think about in court and you're addressing the judge, it's your honor. And he's called the honorable judge so and so or somebody in a particular office because of the office, it's the honorable so-and-so. Well, if there ever was one that occupies a position and place and office with the authority that should be addressed as honorable, it would be the Son of God. So knowing that we will one day stand before the judge, should we not honor him? It's a, sort of a hobby of mine. You've heard me refer to it a few times. To watch a lot of these court cases that are recorded on YouTube. And they have a, sometimes a whole trial on there. Rarely do I get a chance to sit down and because the whole trial takes hours to sit there and watch them. But every once in a while they'll have these things on there where they're sentencing some of these fellows that are rotten to the core. And as the fellow said, it couldn't get any rottener. <laughs> but they have no respect for the judge whatsoever. And there is that which is called contempt of court. And sometimes it is something else to see these fellows just fight that judge. Even as the judge is delivering the sentence, a jury in some cases having found them guilty. And how they will act about that judge. Well, if they will act such people toward a human judge how will people deal with the son of God at this time not realizing that he will be their judge someday and when his sentence is spoken it will be that way forever another reason for honoring Christ and we've touched on it all the way around here is that he's the only one that can offer eternal life to you and me only one to those who hear his words, believing on him, and of course believing on the Father, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, they will be the ones who have that everlasting life. That's the beginning point. Look at verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. 
They will not come into condemnation or judgment. They, they'll pass from death, meaning spiritual death, separation from God, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, into life eternal. We have eternal life in prospect and in promise. Not in reality, but in prospect and promise. For if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So the time for this offer is now. Notice the hour cometh or is coming and now is. John 5, 25. When those who are dead, spiritually speaking, will hear His voice, what is it they hear? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Why that gospel? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16 Thus the call of Christ to reconcile us, to justify us, is the gospel call. When those that are dead spiritually hear the voice of the Son of God in the gospel, they pay attention to it. They take it to heart. From the heart they obey it, Romans 6, 17 and 18, they are saved from their sins. So the idea of hearing is not just hear audible sounds and if they're words we understand them, but it's the idea of complying with the demands of the words of Christ and we'll be saved. It's always been that way because the Son has the power to give life. Look at verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, what? So hath he given to the Son to have life in, him, him, in himself. So this is the case because the Father then does have life in himself. The first person of the Godhead is where all authority and everything else inheres. Christ has authority, but it was given to him of the Father, delegated to him by the Father. And he'll have that authority until the end. When in 1 Corinthians 15, he says you, you'll deliver up the kingdom to God and put down all authority. Now, I don't know what all that will be like, but I want to experience it. I want to be there. I want to be a part of it. don't want to miss it. I want to be a part of it as a resurrected one who's been resurrected into life. So the Father has granted the Son to have life in himself. And the fact that Jesus offers the gift of everlasting life is reason enough to honor Him with all we can do to honor Him. Now, I know that there are other reasons to honor the Son. We're not trying to cover all those. But surely these are the foundation of the fundamentals of why we should. From our text, I think we can learn at least three ways to honor Jesus. And we've already touched upon them. That is hearing his voice. And hearing his voice in the present. When you hear his voice at the end of time, it's too late to change. It's too late to develop belief in him and to repent of sins and to confess that he's the son of God. This is the time of probation. This is the time of determining what we're going to do. Because what we do with him now determines what he will do with us then. One day, we will hear his voice. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. But when we read the totality of the information regarding the end of time, we know there will be people alive here on this earth at the time he comes back. But they're going to hear that voice too. Oh, and by the way, we'll hear him whether we want to or not. His voice will call us to that resurrection of eternal life. And eternal means quality of life. Sometimes I think we confuse that with the fact of eternal consequences in the lost person. That person is fully conscious and exists without end in hell. But it's not eternal life because it's not quality. 
Life is more than mere duration. The people in hell endure. They won't cease. But you can't attach life to that. Life is far more, even living now, than just mere existence. Think of the thousands upon thousands of people that care nothing for God, Christ, the Bible, not even seeking after Him. They exist. But they don't have the quality of life that the faithful child of the living God does. You're on a complete different plane. Notice when you're baptized for the remission of sins, you're baptized, notice the state change. You're baptized into Christ. Now before you were baptized for the remission of sins, you were not in Christ. So you're moved the step closer to the spiritual things when you're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. First of all, you're baptized in that realm where God's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's in Christ. You don't have that outside of Christ. Oh, the rain falls on the just and the unjust also. Or as I've said before, we used to say at Harding, the rain falls on the just and the unjust also, but mainly it falls on the just because the unjust have the just umbrellas. And you have to think about that a minute. But nevertheless, it does happen. But when you become a Christian, there are things you have the person out in the world does not have. I wish we'd realize that as far as being full of thanksgiving, that when we're baptized into Christ, we've changed state. We've gone from death to life. From a child of Satan to a child of our Father in Heaven. From separation from God to reconciliation. From sin to justification. There's a change over us. So we can have everlasting life. And we don't have to come into judgment, meaning condemnation. We pass from death to life by humble obedience to the gospel. God be thanked that you were, past tense used to be, not anymore, the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin. You became, didn't used to be, but you are now. You became, you were this, now you become this. You became the servants of righteousness. So we honor the Son by listening to His words, by understanding His words, by taking our human wills and submitting to His will, by taking those words and obeying them. And we sing a song, let him have his way with you. Then there's the time for obeying his voice, and that's now. I've already brought that up. Common sense says we know that, but we need to think about it. So it's not enough just to hear the words. We know that. But as you read in James, who's writing to those who believe and obey the gospel, who are Christians, he says you've got to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Matthew 7 makes it very clear that, and so Jesus was laying that foundation, that understanding, while he was here on this earth, that you have to be a doer of the word. In Matthew 7, verse 24, the scripture reads, and you're familiar with it, the little kids are, the wise man built his house on the rock. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man. Built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the flood came. The winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. We must be doers of the word. In other words, why call ye me, Jesus said, as he put it in this way, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and know in view of the fact what a Lord is, and do not the things which I say, Luke 6, 46. So it's only by abiding in his word that we are truly his disciples. And that's what Jesus said in John 8, 31. We usually quote 32. You'll notice I quote usually both of them together. If we continue in His Word, then are we disciples. Indeed, indeed's action. 
in deeds work. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. I suggest to you, you'll not be able to experience verse 32 unless you're experiencing first verse 31. So Jesus is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. We are to obey his call to believe in him. John 8, 24. We are to obey his call to repent of our sins, Luke 13, 3. We are to hear his voice and obey his call to confess him before others, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And, of course, to obey him in being baptized for the remission of sins, Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 16. But we don't want to leave this out. Sometimes we stop right there. That's just the beginning. That's just the birth into the kingdom of water and the Spirit. That's becoming a babe in Christ. Now the next part. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2.10. So the question is, will we honor the Son by heeding His voice today? Then, too, we honor the Son by seeking the Father's will now. Not tomorrow. Certainly can't go back to yesterday. Now. Jesus, while he was on this earth, had that time to do whatever it took, whatever God had given him, to save us. John 5 and verse 30, we have, I think, brought out quite clearly that Jesus recognized that very fact about himself. His time would end. John 5, 30 reads, I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear. I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now, when was that to be done? It could be done before he came. It couldn't be done after he left. It had to be done now. And the Lord made it very clear, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man shall work. There is an end to opportunity. The opportunity to have to be saved while we're living in this body right now. His food, if you please, John 4, 34, was to do the Father's will. And we're taught we must hunger and thirst after righteousness as if it is our necessary food. He came down from heaven to do the Father's will, John 6, 38. He glorified the Father by doing the work that was given Him to do, John 17, 4. And that's the only way we glorify God, is to do the work He's given us to do. And Jesus wants us to do the Father's will. And the will of the Father has been committed to the Son. Thus, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him, Colossians three seventeen. It's the only way to enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 7, 21 and 23. It's the only way to be a part of God's family, a brother and sister in Christ. We therefore had best honor the Son by following the example of Jesus as He honored the Father. I said at the beginning this was a very simple lesson. But I think you will agree, believing the Bible to be the infallible, inerrant, all-sufficient, final, and complete revelation to God to man, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, that these words are very important when it comes to the honoring of Christ and how we honor Him. All should honor the Son today. He's certainly worthy of that honor. It's interesting that as your inspiration is about to close forevermore in that last book, that in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12, this is said of the Christ. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Now that is a picture of things going on in heaven. And that's the extolling of the Christ done, given to us to see, and the attitude the blessed church should have 
because he is our head. He purchased us. He redeemed us. And you'll see too in verse 13 that the Father is certainly worthy of the same. Because you can't worship the Father and not worship the Son. You can't worship the Son not worship the Father. Listen in verse 13 of Revelation 5. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now that's the Father and Son. And there's the same disposition. And we should cultivate that in ourselves here. All will honor the Son someday. The rankest atheists, the most corrupt, immoral people, they will respond to the voice of Christ in the resurrection. John 5, 28, 29. We are taught in Romans 14, 10 through 11 and Philippians 2, 9, and 11, that at the second coming of our Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. A split second before, they may have been cursing God and using every kind of foul thing in the world and engaging no cattle in what kind of ungodliness. But that knee will bow and they will all acknowledge Christ to be who the Bible said he was, but too late to do them any good. For those willing to honor Jesus today by hearing, believing, and obeying his words, they will be honored together with him in that final day. We'll close with these words from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 10 and 12. Again, these are, these are not new words to you, but they certainly fit in a sermon like this. Verse 10, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Notice, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. That's Paul to our brethren of almost 2,000 years ago as he wrote part of the New Testament to encourage them, to strengthen them. And so it does the same for us if we will let it influence us. So here we close saying again that all should honor the Son and giving a few simple reasons but bold and powerful reasons why we should. Christ does hold this whole world in his hand. For the lost are saved. And when the last day comes, he'll deal with the lost and the saved. And he will pronounce either salvation eternal or condemnation eternal on everybody that's ever lived. And there's no middle ground. And all of us dependent upon our attitude toward him now and our reception or rejection of his word. If you're subject to the blessed gospel call of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.